Welcome back to the uh, Nutramedical Report, and we are joined by Tim Alexander with an emergency report, and of course, Harley Schlanger, all the way from Austria. Uh, Tim, tell us the uh, full story, and then we'll probably do a follow-up in hour number three. Uh, What's the urgent story? What's happening? Israeli Air Force jets have bombed the Damascus area, striking a arms depot. Uh, almost certainly a strategic arms depot containing chemical uh, weapons. Well, the reason why they do that is they know that the, the Bashar Assad's regime, if it falls, is going to fall into the hands of maniacs. Bashar Assad is an eye doctor who's unlikely to use them, but the maniacs that have been funded well, by the he's, Qataris he's, and Saudis he's are likely. Falling. He's not falling, but, uh, and in fact, his uh, forces have been making uh, quite a bit of headway in the last couple of weeks. But, uh, uh, but the problem is, is what I have for my war. Right, but it, it's, it's an act of war that directly has struck vital strategic weapons of mass destruction assets. Now, does, so they is it likely that lots of lines, and this just happened? Now, uh, Tim, uh, we want to do a full expansion on this, and we'll want to hear Harley's response too. Uh, how likely is it that that? Syria, in its crippled state right now, dealing with its, uh, and I heard this as well, because the news media is trying to spin that the Assad regime is going to fall. I personally don't think they are. I think any fall is a future date for a much broader and an international yeah, the war. The media was setting this event up. Right, and the thing is that I, uh, what, what was the purpose of Israel doing this? I mean, was it to stabilize well, things Israel, or destabilize it? Uh, Israel's, uh, look, Syria is the back door to a war with Iran, and they've been getting closer and closer to losing that back door. Assad said about two days ago that if the outside influence uh, and assistance would stop, the war would be over in two weeks or less. Exactly. And they've begun the process of, of retaking all the land which they allowed them to take because they were concentrating on protecting key assets. They're now in the process of cleaning out the so-called rebels, which are all foreign fighters, but right. this so so the time is short. But remember, two things have happened: the Americans have had this, we have had our election, and Israel has just had its election, and Netanyahu is is being returned to the prime minister. So you didn't hear much about Syria from the American mainstream media for a while. Now all of a sudden, you know, you have these horrors, and it's about to fall, and the and the bad guys. Chemical yeah. warheads, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, well, wait, stay, for this. wait to stay, stay there for a second. Let, let's let's uh, expand on this with uh, Harley, but stay there, Tim. Sure. And I want you to come back in hour three if you can, and we'll do a real big expansion on this on the military and geopolitical. Uh, what do you think, Harley, of uh, this there, there are two other uh, air factors attack? Here, one is that there was a report uh, from a British uh, defense. Uh, uh, I guess you'd call it a paramilitary operation that they had. There was a leaked email that they had been commissioned by Qatar to carry out a, a weapons, a chemical weapons attack and blame it on Assad. Now, I don't know how reliable that is, but that's part of this whole picture. The other thing, as Tim knows, is that Netanyahu will probably return to power, but significantly weakened in this last election. Uh, when he first announced the early election, he thought he was going to have a big victory. And there were larger numbers of people who turned out to vote in Israel. The whole defense establishment has come out against uh, Netanyahu as being unreliable, unacceptable. There's a, a new documentary called The Gatekeepers, which has the six past leaders of the defense intelligence establishment denouncing Netanyahu, and so he was on the way down. This is his way of maintaining uh, a hand in the thing. It's probably coordinated with Obama, and Tim is absolutely right. Uh, I agree with Assad you, by the way. Is, Assad is winning the war. Right. So, in other words, this is a move by Israel because uh, they have been uh, manipulated to uh, to to take this move because they're they're losing their chance to take a shot at Iran. I, honestly, I think though, any shot at Iran means a thermonuclear war between the great powers. This is not something that Israel is going to start. That's just we going to be a local are regional one war. One second to midnight. Right. Yeah. So, in other words, if Israel attacked Tehran right now, 
We would have incoming missiles in Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, Houston, New York City, etc. We would have a full thermonuclear, biological, and chemical, and scalar war instantaneously, and within 90 to 120 minutes, half of the population of the United States would be in ashes and media yeah, maker. Yeah, but it, 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 it won't necessarily take place on the same day. There could be a, a prolonged Well, there may, be, there, may be a, there may be a warm-up to that, but the warm-up won't be long. It'll be weeks, not months. But remember, I have been calling Netanyahu, the biblical antichrist, for an extremely long time, actually over 20 years. Well, he's and definitely the a major player. Do, there's, no, there's no doubt that he's a major player. Uh, you know, well, the and, reason I do is I see him as the key figure, uh, both 91177 in the U.K. and uh, the key what? figure, the, the, the person with his finger on the button. And Harvey is totally right about the Israeli political situation. It, it, it's still, you, you have the old uh, cabinet still uh, as caretakers right now. Everything is kind of up, but he, but he has power right now. And this is the character that uh, is, is so incredibly evil. And, and the people, the military people, the intelligence people, they know that if he starts a war, most people in Israel will die. And oh, yeah. 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 Just, just, just so yeah. it's known, he's, he's evil and he's crazy. But he also got a go-ahead from Obama. You know, Obama called him before the negotiations for the new government are finished yet. They're still in the process of putting together a coalition. And he hasn't succeeded yet. But Obama called him and congratulated him. So this is, I would say, when you talk about Netanyahu as a, the biblical Antichrist, I don't put Obama that far behind him in terms uh -huh. of... The, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Oh, what, yeah. what do you call him, Bill? The uh, the false false prophet, prophet. Right? false prophet. Yeah, yeah he, so he I, is. I think what we're dealing with is a group of completely failed leaders who, thanks in the United States to the media, kept Obama in power, and also the the sorrowful campaign run by the Republicans. But this is. Uh, part of a, a regional war strategy uh, of which Netanyahu is a key player. Uh, the Al-Qaeda networks, which are largely funded by Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Uh, ironically, the Saudis have uh, are bed partners with uh, Netanyahu in this. Yeah, in fact, uh, what, this is interesting. I found this out from my intelligence sources, that there's conjoint officers that are in the uh, secret intelligence services of the Israeli government that are also in the intelligence services of Saudi. And the Saudis and the Israelis were directly complicit at 9-11. Now, the CIA were on the side and watching them and knew that it was happening, but it was Israeli-Saudi operation. And I have that from both the 9-11, the 7-7 the bombings were all uh, done by Israeli Saudi forces. Yeah, uh, I'm going to get off, and you you want me to come back the third hour? A third hour, we're going to have uh, Pastor Dave Lee, but I want to deal with this on a geopolitical, military, biblical uh, issue because the forces are, we talked yesterday with uh, Bill Salas about the biblical Psalm 83 issues. In fact, uh, of the expansion of the military operations of Israel and the fact of the fall of Egypt. Egypt is right now with Mohammed Morsi in a civil war. Uh, this is not the end of the disaster when they get rid of Mubarak. It's the beginning of the disaster of Egypt. Well, and, Morsi uh, today was in Berlin to beg for some aid. Uh, but the, the situation, is, uh, I think, is best characterized as something bigger than the Balkans were right before World War I. Only, right. as, as we've been discussing, we're no longer dealing with conventional month-long buildups. We're talking about nuclear weapons that are on the sites. Right, exactly, yeah. And, and people should understand that Egypt is a major military power. Uh, it's now, in a sense, going to have an internal civil war that's going to really drag it down. And if Egypt gets hauled in on the side of attacking Israel, uh, all they need, Israelis have to do is hit the Aswan Dam and a 100-foot high wall of water will wipe out most of his, Egypt. That's the reality. Back in a moment with more. Carly Schlanger from the Roos Foundation and Tim back in Hour 3 with Pastor Dave Lee in the studio. You don't want to miss it. Stay tuned.
back and uh, Harley, I'd like you to expand on some of the important topics we're going to cover today. Uh, I don't think people realize just how uh, tenuous things are. Not that it's the quote the end of the world, but we're going to go through some very rough times. You know, if, if tell people I'm not fearful of Friday the 13th, but this year, 2013, with uh, the danger of major CME attacks, a financial a bank holiday almost certain, an expanding Middle Eastern war, and now this air attack on, on Damascus and chemical weapons plants by Israel, uh, the emergent uh, and re-elected Netanyahu government that are plainly psychopathic, uh, the attitude of Russia against and Medvedev, his comments about the air defense system, uh, the very ticked off nature of the Chinese to the, in a sense, movements to devalue the U.S. currency. We're in a currency war right now. Uh, we're in an economic war and have been since 9-11, especially since 2007 when the um, economic collapse started, 2008. But let me clarify one thing, though. It's not that China's at war with us. It's that Obama and Wall Street is at war with the U.S. dollar. Well, that's true. The, the U.S. dollar, is, and there's no need to attack. We could be energy independent. We could have credit like the Hamiltonian system that you've talked about. And one of the things I want to clarify, and I hear people that make these comments and say that, you know, that what LaRouche Foundation is proposing is, quote, socialism, which is anti-capitalist, et cetera, and that's not true at all. Uh, what we're doing is we need a framework so we can have national credit, where we have a national bank, we have state banks, where we have credit for business, where we have true capitalism, which we don't now. We have what we call international corporatism and a false, what we call ghost economy, where money is made basically on money, where they literally gamble on everything. I mean, they can gamble who's going to be on the halftime show. Uh, this is how, how derivatives are done. It's literally gambling on gambling. It's craziness. Well, and I, I'd like to come back to a couple of these points, but I, I actually want to start with something that uh, can give people a little bit of hope. Yes, let's and do that. That is that there was a court ruling that didn't get a lot of play, but it was the one of the highest appeals courts in the country, the appeals court in Washington, D.C., heard a case involving Obama's so-called recess appointment of commissioners to the National Labor Relations Board. And this was one of these times where the Senate said they were not officially in recess, but Obama, being the, the unitary executive figure that he is, thinking that he's actually the one who can determine Senate rules better than the Senate, he declared that it was a recess and made the appointment. And these new commissioners have been writing labor laws for the last uh, year and a half. Now, the Court of Appeals delivered Obama the most powerful blow that's been given to him since he's been president. They said that what he did is a violation of the Constitution, that it would eviscerate the checks and balance system by making the legislative side uh, irrelevant. They said it would demolish the advise and consent role of the Senate, and that if it's allowed to stand, it would be the greatest usurpation of executive power in our nation's history. Now, immediately, apologists for Obama came out and said, well, but presidents have been doing this for a while. Bush did it. Clinton did it. Uh, for a hundred-something years, they've been doing it. And the, Supreme, the, the, the appeals court, rather, said that doesn't matter if people have been doing it in the past. It's still wrong, and we're ruling on this case that this is an unacceptable assertion of executive authority. Now, think about the implications of that. There are two implications. One, finally, someone stood up against Obama. And secondly, the issue that's involved of executive privilege or executive authority, this is behind things like the, the protection of uh, Eric Holder on uh, Fast and Furious. This is Obama saying that he doesn't have to go to the Congress to declare a war or to uh, go in, get involved in a fight like we did in Libya. Uh, Obama is saying he has a right to an executive order on climate change, on gun control. So his whole policy has been to argue that since the Congress won't give him what he wants, but the 
people elected him twice. He therefore has the power as the executive to act over and above the constitutional limits to that power. And the court said, Mr. President, you do not have that power. Yeah, in other words, this is a total rebuke to his attitude that he has a mandate to do anything he wants. That's exactly the point. Now, the question is, what will, will the Supreme Court accept it? There are two other rulings coming up on something similar. I think one in the Southern District of Florida uh, Appeals Court and, and a third one on similar issues of executive authority. Now, this really means that the Congress, if the Congress has any sense, would, would, would now stand up and say, well, we knew what the president was doing was wrong, and now we're not going to put up with it anymore. And under these circumstances, if he tries to continue this, there should be a bill of impeachment starting through the House of Representatives immediately. Yeah, and I think that the uh, we need to start actually building in a dossier for impeachment. We already have that for his first term. And I would say if we just run through a short list, we have uh, not only the National Defense Authorization Act, we have the illegal wars in Libya and Tunisia, we have the arming of al-Qaeda, which are clearly our enemy. Uh, we have so many reasons why this man should have been impeached in the first term. In the second term, he now thinks he has a mandate, even though it was 11 million fewer voters. There was voter fraud, we can clearly see. We can also see that he used Chicago-style politics to strong-arm his supporters. And uh, in some districts, we have 100% votes for Obama and none for Romney. We know that this is uh, a not a mandate in any way. And, of course, with the shared powers between the three uh, branches of government, Obama, supposedly a constitutional expert, is saying that doesn't matter, and now he's been rebuked. This is fantastic news, isn't it? Well, and the court said that, you know, Obama basically said that the Senate was wrong in saying that they were not on recess. And the court said, but the Senate is allowed to interpret its rules as the Senate leadership wishes. There's nothing in the Constitution which says the president can override the rules of the Senate based on his desire. And so it, it is an absolute slap, not just against Obama, but against this pattern going back, remember Nixon and the imperial presidency. Right. We've had this tendency going back 40-something years right now. So in other words, why it's been reviewed is not just Obama. It's the imperial prerogative of the office of the president. Yeah, and the fact is that the Founding Fathers, in drafting the Constitution, explicitly stated in the debates over and over and over that they wanted a president who had power, but that power had to be checked by two other branches of equal power, the legislative branch and the judicial branch. And the reason they did that was because they had just made a revolution against the British in which the monarch had all the power over especially credit, currency, and debt. And the idea of the Founding Fathers was that you have to create institutions of self-government which can act directly in the interest of the people. Uh, but cannot do so on behalf of private interests, the way the British monarchy did. Right. And what Obama has done is act on behalf of private interests. Exactly. Amazing. Remarkable developments. Back in a moment with Harley Schlanger foundation larouche pac.com larouche pub.com eir executive intelligence review back in just a moment i remember when i remember i remember when i lost my Welcome back, and Harley, um, we discussed some interesting things on the break. We need to get into this, uh, what's going on with the bank in Europe that's about to probably bring down the banking system there. We have Obama, of course, who thinks he's got a mandate to do almost anything. He's been rebuked. I would guess because the money's running out of the ECB, the European Central Bank, and the Stability Fund, it's almost certain that Obama is going to try to use his executive orders or his power to get his um, the Europeans pop, propped up with the... Uh, money from the Federal Reserve, which is further going to devalue the American currency and further push us toward a bank holiday sometime probably this year. Well, let, let's go back to the implications of this uh, U.S. District Court of Appeals ruling in uh, the District of Columbia. What this puts on the table now is that any time Obama uh, resorts to executive action, executive authority, executive power as the excuse for ramming through a policy, 
this becomes immediately uh, a basis for a congressional review and possible impeachment action. Now, this is why the uh, HCR3, which is the bill by Walter Jones, a congressman from North Carolina, uh, he's a Republican, but Walter Jones um, put this resolution together, which just restates the Constitution, that any offensive military action by the president without going to the Congress is an impeachable act. Now, Obama just announced yesterday something like $150 million of so-called humanitarian aid to the Syrian rebels. If a penny of that goes to any uh, military action, or if money that's not part of that but is off budget goes to military action, as the U.S. is working with Qatar and Saudi Arabia to arm the so-called rebels, and those arms are going to al-Qaeda-linked al-Nusra forces in Syria, then there's another basis for impeachment because Obama has not gone to the Congress to ask them for that money. And so under the U.S. Constitution, that's an impeachable offense. So I think we've got a situation now where, as we were talking over the break, there are three or four or five issues where Obama has committed impeachable crimes, but up to this point he's been given a free ride by the Congress. And part of this is the dysfunctional nature of the Republican Party and the fact that Democrats are being blackmailed by Obama. And speaking of blackmail, did you see that interview that Hillary Clinton and Obama did on 60 Minutes? No, I actually, I didn't take my anti nauseants that day, and I wasn't capable of watching well, you, it. You needed anti nauseants. I mean, I'm just surprised they didn't start pawing each other uh, the way they were, were kissing each other's rear end. And even uh, Steve Croft, the 60 Minutes guy, was saying, are you sure that this is the two people I saw in 2008? I mean, it was quite disgusting. But the point is that the Democrats have attached themselves to Obama, even they, though they know he's going to wreck the party. Uh, there are a number of, of Democrats who are up in the Senate for re-election in 2014 who will have to vote against Obama on gun control or else they'll lose their election. This is the Senator Begich from Alaska, Landrew from Louisiana, Pryor from Arkansas, uh, Hagan from North Carolina, and I think there are one or two others. Uh, now, the key thing is that if Obama can't get a bill through, he's threatened to use executive power. And if he does that, that's another potentially impeachable offense. So the, the ball is now in the court of the, the House of Representatives. The Republicans or the Democrats could initiate a measure of impeachment. This is much more serious than what Clinton did. It's more serious than what Nixon did with Watergate, because... The, the Watergate activity didn't result in deaths, whereas Obama's policies have resulted in deaths. So I, I think we're in a period where the American people are going to have to encourage and, and <clears throat> if necessary, browbeat the Congress to take their responsibility seriously. Now that the court has said the Congress has the right to act over and above this executive power, uh, it's up to the Congress to assert their, their constitutional authority. What I expect to happen between now and May 18th when the, uh, the uh, proverbial financial hits the wall, uh, John Bonner and the split in the Republican Party, especially with these statements by this court, uh, my guess is you're going to start seeing movements to the word impeachment of Obama. Because Obama is determined to shove through an agenda. He wants to put carbon credits as part of the condition of opening up the Bakken uh, oil fields and oil shale fields. He wants to uh, attach a carbon yeah, tax. His, his second inauguration address was almost entirely green, green, green. Right. He wants to actually attach green to everything, which yeah. will kill the economy. If you just have to look at Spain, for every, uh, for every dollar they spent, uh, on green, they lost two and a half uh, dollars in money and, and kill their jobs and their economy because Spain, before the uh, Green Revolution a decade ago, was doing fantastic. They were building most of the new factories are being built in Spain. For well, Europe. Germany's going into a negative growth because of the shutdown of nuclear power in Germany. Uh, I'll come back to Europe in a moment, but the, the important thing is, and this is really crucial for your listeners to understand, people who say, well, no one will fight, we can't win, well, someone did fight. It was a court, but it was a court that said standing for principles of law is more important than popular opinion. And that's the beginning of a potential 
for a groundswell to impeach this president. Yeah. And it's not on questions that uh, uh, can be trivialized. These are fundamental principles. Does the president have the right to act like a dictator and assert his authority over and above the Constitution? The answer is no. He'd been doing it, but now someone finally said, no, you can't do it. Right. What's, what's really good about this is that the, uh, the operation of the U.S. Constitution works. It actually works. Exactly. And, and don't forget, one of the most important parts of the Constitution was the preceding document, the Declaration of Independence, which said, we the people. Right. And uh, actually, that's the Constitution. We the, the Constitution, people. yeah. We, we the people, yeah. and of course, uh, it, it deals with the, with the uh, amendments. I think there's 27 amendments. Uh, the only one that was turned back was prohibition. And beyond that, what it basically means is that in order to uh, overturn even a, a veto power of the president against any bill, uh, two-thirds of the, of the majority in the Senate and Congress can overturn it. Uh, we don't have a proper balance. Obama's literally trying to throw the apple cart completely over the cliff. And he's so, not so, going to succeed. We've, so we've got to get the Congress now to take up their responsibility. And that includes, by the way, I don't know if you heard this, but so far they've been unable to find a single person who's willing to serve as a commissioner on the Independent Payment Advisory Board, the, the IPAB death panel of Obamacare. And now there's a bill to repeal it. Well, I, I can say that the, the, the iPad death panel, uh, to be honest with you, when an officer does something that puts in harm's way a U.S. citizen, they personally can be sued. We just had a lawsuit that we won October 5th. It's being uh, finalized this Friday in a uh, federal court in Austin, Texas, where uh, we, as the Association of Physicians and Surgeons, American Association of Physicians and Surgeons, filed against the Texas State Medical Board in federal court. We won. And we won against them because they had uh, attempted to pull the license of Dr. William Ray, who's the director of the Dallas Environmental Clinic, the top environmental clinic in human history, the uh, Steven Star Clinic, former cardiac surgeon, founder uh, of the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, the largest academy on earth, wrote more articles, more published reports, more tomes, and he has an encyclopedia of environmental medicine. And yet they pulled his, tried to pull his license because the insurance carrier anonymously filed a claim because five patients, they didn't want to pay for their care, and the patients were totally happy with their care at his clinic from New York City from the 9-11 syndrome, from heavy metals and toxic chemicals that they got from the demolition of those buildings. Uh, and we won against them. And now that means those uh, members of the, of the board of examiners, they can be personally sued and or jailed or their assets seized. The same thing goes with any panel members. If they make decisions that cause the death or harm to any citizen, they're going to go to the big house and wear an orange jumpsuit. They're going to have their assets seized. This is not a little a minor game here because these panels are going to kill people. In fact, here's how it works. You send in a diagnosis from a doctor. This is 2014 when it's fully implemented. Uh, the doctor, seconds later, gets back a protocol of what they have to do. First violation is a $100,000 fine. Second is prison time for the doctor if they don't comply with the federal mandate. Well, that's the dictatorship. Yeah. That's just it, another element of it. I tell them if they can't stop it, every doctor in the country needs to quit on the spot. We need to stop this. We are, have a bill in the House right now to defund and turn this back right now. analysis to make in terms of um, what's going on in banking in Europe. And again, remember, the transatlantic banking system is a single system. It's not a dual system. It's centered in London, uh, which includes also, by the way, the setting of the price of gold at 8 a.m. with morning tea with Lord Evelyn Rothschild in the GMT Greenwich Mean Time. People need to understand that what's going on is Europe needs, uh, in the next 16 months, as you said, 9.8 trillion with a T dollars, 
uh, as much as Bernanke and Geithner have been sneaking money to the Europeans for uh, the last four years, and even before with George Bush at a lesser extent, uh, the amount of money cannot be uh, done covertly. This is going to... Well, this is, this is $9.4 trillion bank debt that has to be rolled over right. on top of $3.6 trillion sovereign debt. Right. And there's no entity in Europe that has that. But let me start with this very phenomenal story out of Italy, uh, because this is possibly where the whole apple cart's going to get tipped over. There's the third largest bank in Italy is in the city of Siena, Uh, And it's called the Monte de Pasci de Siena. And this is a bank that very few people know about, but it's the oldest continuous bank in the world. It goes back to the middle of the 15th century. When pilgrims, I mean the early 15th century, when pilgrims would go on their way to Rome, Siena was right in the middle of northern Europeans. And so they became a banking center. It was tied to Venice. became a very large banking center. It's at the center of politics in Italy. And what happened is a couple of years ago, they made a bad bet. And they thought it was a $220 million derivative loss. It's right now hemorrhaging. It's $4 billion today has already been uh, given to them as a bailout by the Bank of Italy. But they need two or three times that. Now, the problem is that this is not just one bank. It's one bank that's directly connected to the French banks. And the three largest banks in France are holding... uh, uh, I think it's $800 billion of Italian debt, $400 billion of Spanish debt, and this is debt that's not going to get paid. Now, the important thing further is that this bank uh, has been a subject of two cover-ups. First of all, in 2009, when this whole problem started, the head of the Bank of Italy who bailed them out is a man named Mario Draghi, who is today the head of the European Central Bank. And before that, he was Goldman Sachs' head for Europe. Secondly, as this bank started hemorrhaging uh, eight weeks ago, Mario Monti, who's the former Goldman Sachs guy, who's the uh, caretaker uh, prime minister of Italy, Monti covered up the bailout. Now, Monti was the choice to be elected in the upcoming Italian elections. His main opponent, everyone thought they could get uh, Berlusconi to run again. He's somewhat of a clown, so they thought Monti could win. Instead, a friend of Lyndon LaRouche named Giulio Tremonti, the former finance minister, is leading the opposition. And as the scandal increases, you have two problems. One is the whole banking system could go. In the meantime, the whole support for the banking system and this European Union bureaucracy could take a huge defeat if Tremonti wins the Italian election and stops the bailout of this bank. Yeah. And so that's where we stand on it. Now, what Tremonti is campaigning on is that we need Glass-Steagall. If Italy had Glass-Steagall, this bank would have been never bailed out and would have been put into bankruptcy four years ago. Now, that is the debating issue all over Europe, where you have the LIBOR scandal, you have drug money laundering scandals, you have carbon tax emission scandals, Deutsche Bank's at the center of them, BNP Paribas, the biggest bank in France, is at the center. And what they're trying to do is push through the equivalent of the Dodd-Frank bill in Europe, which is a regulatory monstrosity which will do nothing to stop the derivatives risk problem that's threatening to blow out the system. Yeah, in fact, what they're trying to do is they're trying to use the weapon of the debt monster that they've created to make a federated Europe with a central uh, federated financial control system that's completely tyrannical. The the tyrannical that results in austerity that kill millions of Europeans in starvation and devastation. And while they're doing that, they're unable to borrow the money because the Russians won't give it to them, the Chinese won't give it to them, even the crazy Arabs won't give it to them. And so they're unable to get the funds they need to do the minimum bailouts. You know, when I say a minimum bailout, I'm talking about if you figure they need $9.4 trillion, they might be able to scrape together some of that, but they're somewhere between 5 and $6 trillion short. 
Now, that's a lot of money, and that's more than Bernanke and Geithner can slip in through the back door. Right. And so they're going to either have to let one or two of these banks go, which could trigger a total collapse, or they're just going to have to print money through the European Central Bank, which will trigger a hyperinflation. Well, I think the and first the thing you're going to see is a massive uh, withdrawal. Anybody that sees this collapse happening, even in banks in America or Canada... It's already happening. You're it's already start, happening you're, you're gonna, in, in, in Italy. Yeah. You're going to see massive withdrawals, and once that happens, there's no liquid capital except the drug money that's being laundered, and as a result, these banks are going to go down. And I expect a bank holiday sometime this spring or summer. And it may only be five days, but I see a massive devaluation of the U.S. dollar. The Chinese will be left holding uh, trillions of dollars of debt that they don't want to pay. And by the way, they still owe us trillions of dollars they got before the Chinese Revolution. We had an expert on four months ago talking about this. The fact is that the Chinese are angry as hell about this, and they and the Arabs and the Muslims, they're not getting what they want out of the deal. And well, Bill, here's the other point on Europe. The, the guy who's committed to the bailout is Mario Draghi, but he's now caught up in the scandal of Monte de Pasci, so he may not be around much longer. Right. The former uh, leading banker in Europe, Joseph Ackermann from Deutsche Bank, is completely discredited by the fact that his bank is now caught up in about five different legal suits, any one of which could bankrupt them. Uh, the, the, leading, the three leading bankers in France uh, went before the French Parliament today to plead with the Parliament not to enact any banking reform. You have in England, the, the incoming head of the Bank of England is Mark Carney, the former head of the Bank of Canada and former Goldman Sachs official, who's opposed to Glass-Steagall. But the outgoing uh, bank head, Mervyn King, is uh, promoting a guy named Andrew Haldane, who is a proponent, a supporter of Glass-Steagall. And now we have the Glass-Steagall bill uh, re-submitted uh, in the U.S. Congress. I think it's... Uh, HR 129. It's the Marcy Captor. Yeah. How, how many supporters do we? Banking. How many supporters do we have of that? Because once they reach a threshold, and by the way, this is the silver spike, nine-inch nail in the center of the heart of the of the Dracula super banking system. Uh, once this nine-inch spike is put here, the vampire is dead. Glass Steagall means no more bailouts of the shadow banking system. I mean, even Richard Fisher, the head of the Dallas Federal Reserve, gave a very important speech a week and a half ago in Washington in which he said, look, we have to end the too-big-to-fail banks. We have to stop bailing out the shadow banking system. Let them stand or fall on their own, but no more government money for them. So if we could get, and Thomas Honig, the former president of the Kansas City Fed, who's now on the board of the FDIC, is an open supporter of Glass-Steagall. So if we can get Glass-Steagall through, it puts an end to the bailouts. If this happens in conjunction with an impeachment action against Obama, we can save our nation. Yeah. And that's what Lyndon LaRouche is going to be talking about this Friday night on his regular Friday webcast at the uh, LaRouchePack.com. You may, in fact, see behavior coming out of this financial disaster that will prepare the way for the impeachment, because I believe that Obama's behavior, now rebuked in terms of his appointments to the Labor Board, uh, will will uh, put him in, in even more trouble, especially with the an air attack against uh, Damascus, because the bankers have been just seething to see the fall of the Syrian regime, and it absolutely looks like no sign in sight that Syria is falling. I know the media keeps on pushing this. It's not going to happen. The only well, time the Damascus... Well, the leader of the Syrian national opposition said we're losing ground, and part of it is the honest coverage of the fact that the Syrian national opposition has no real fighting force except al-Qaeda fighters from all over the Middle East. Exactly. The real Syrian, what they do is they also try to recruit Syrian men at threat that they'll kill their entire family unless they go and fight with them and they try to escape in the night and if they escape and they catch them, they kill them. And it's the human rights mafia that's lying by saying Assad is killing people. Assad's not a great guy, but he's defending his nation against al-Qaeda. Exactly. Exactly. Amazing this uh, play. If they need to contact you, what's the number again? 800? 800-922-2907. 800 Join us to impeach Obama. Absolutely. Any breaking news, call me. We'll put up a live stream channel interview anytime, day or night. We'll see you next week. Back in a moment, hour two, hour three, coming up with in studio Pastor Dave Lee and Tim Alexander. <laughs> 